Greetings. This lecture is on human resource planning, retention, and absenteeism. And these three topics are addressed together because the better that we're able to plan for our human resources in the organization, we're more likely to be able to retain them and minimize absenteeism and other problems. And this all ties in with our lecture on motivation because, you know, we want to make sure that we're doing all the right things in order to keep our workers as motivated as we, as we can. Um, and so hand-in-hand uh, hand with that is ensuring that we address all the important issues for dealing with retention um, and absenteeism. So, This first slide is the Human Resource Management System. And in the Human Resource Management System, you can see the HR function going from planning to implementation to outcomes, as we discussed in class. And this um, phase, we're looking at the HR planning side of things and how important it is for us to do a good job to forecast to plan. And we do our forecasting and planning based on what we know about the company's policies and programs and strategies and things like that. This next slide is a great example. It's a flow diagram of how we can go from strategic HR planning, how do we deal with whether or not we have a um, or how many people we need versus how many people we have. So what we do is we forecast what our demand is, what we're going to, um, to need um, in order to be able to meet our strategic objectives. And then we have to be able to forecast what the supply is. How many people do we have available in our company that have the skills we need versus how many people are we going to need to that may in the local area have the skills that we need. And if the demand matches the supply, we're in good shape, then we don't have to worry about hiring or firing or laying anybody off. But if it doesn't match, um, then we have to decide either we're going to be hiring new people or we have to lay off people one way or the other. So our next slide then says, how do we go about assessing that external workforce? And when we're assessing, assessing the external workforce to see what we have available to us, we need to be considering things like the economy. Now we've already talked about this when we talked about the external environment, right? We talk about how when the economy is um, improving, um, there are a lot more jobs available. When the economy is not so good, there's less jobs available. So we have to be um, mindful of what's kind of going on. And, you know, are there incentives out there from the government to hire new people? Um, so, you know, there's all sorts of programs out there. So we've got to be aware of those factors because this influences whether or not we have a workforce that we can turn to to hire people. Then we need to um, look at what our competitors are doing and figure out what's the best approach based on what the competitors are doing. And then lastly, we want to consider, um, you know, some of the changes in the demographics and uh, changes in our own workforce to see um, you know, what things are kind of going on out there and are these factors that we're going to have to consider when we're bringing on people. For example, do people have enough education? Do they have the skills that we need? And if they don't, how do we go about and manage that? One of the ways that we can uh, look at um, internally what's going on is doing a job or skill audit. And if you remember, we talked about human resource information systems and these HRIS um, systems, um, their goal is to keep track of many, many things that go on in HR, but one of the great things that it can do is it keeps a, a, a record of the jobs that people do and the skills that they have, so we know what people are capable of doing, what they're doing now, who reports to whom, what are the KSAs needed to do the job, what kind of characteristics are needed for particular jobs, and so when we are able to align the KSAs that we need versus the KSAs that our employees have, and then we can um, we can hopefully figure out how to make sure that we get the skills that we need to do that job. And we can do that in one of two ways. We can hire people um, who have the skills, or we can train our current people to have those skills. But one way or the other, that's the, the kinds of things that we need to do to assess what's going on inside our company. Do we have the skills needed? Um, as well as assessing outside of the company, if we need to hire people, do they have the skills that we need? Other things that we could do internally is to look at uh, capability inventories, sort of databases, or um, you know, just having people fill out um, you know inven regular inventories about stuff that's kind of going on um, in terms of their careers and demographics and things like that. 
when we forecast, we can use a lot of different method, methods to do that. Sometimes managers just do their best guess, or they say, well, last year we used this, and then we'll probably need something similar. And a lot of times that comes from experience and intuition, um, but intuition is not the best predictor. Our goal is if we're going to make forecasting, we want it based on hard, solid data that means something. So we will go engage in things like a computer simulation or regression analysis or Markovian analysis, but our goal is to be able to project if we, you know, trend analysis. If the trend is moving upwards, then we want to be able to predict, you know, whether or not that that's a good trend to have. The judgmental versus mathematical. Well, judgment is based on managers' opinions and managers' ideas and managers' experiences, and, and that's good in a limited sense. But it's not always something that we can rely on, and, and our mathematical models always outperform man. So the more that we can quantify these kinds of things, the better off we are. So the next couple slides get at the different kinds of judgmental techniques that we can do. For example, estimates, rule of thumbs, Delphi techniques, which is sort of a brainstorming process, or nominal group technique, which is another kind of organized brainstorming process. And these are ways that we can gather data and, and, and make more qualitative decisions. Mathematical models are things like productivity ratios, staffing ratios, simulation models, regression analysis, and all those descriptions are there. I think they're fairly straightforward, and since many of you guys have already had um, management, uh, the uh, MS 250 and 251, you understand you know, some of those basics of, of how to do those um, you know, statistical models in order to be able to predict things. So in forecasting the, the supplies, we, we should look at things that affect our external supply. Migration in and out of the area, skill levels, um, technological advances, economic forecasts in the area. Um, one thing that we can consider is what is the economic conditions here versus other locations. You know, you may be in a situation where your, your unemployment rate is really low, so it's hard to find qualified people, but you might decide to recruit in areas where unemployment rate is higher. Um, and so, for example, Trek Bicycles, um, a number of years ago in the uh, Wisconsin area, had very low unemployment, and so when they needed to expand their business, they didn't have the skills that they needed. So they found out that Boeing was laying off engineers in Seattle, so they went to Seattle and they recruited those engineers to move from Seattle to come to Wisconsin and to come and work at the um, truck bicycle uh, plant in, um, in uh, Wisconsin. So you don't always have to limit yourself to just the local area where you are hiring and where you exist as an, as an organization. You can open up the doors and really you know, actively go after where there are pockets of skills that you might need in order to bring people on. So this is a great uh, list of different factors that we need to consider when we're thinking about the things that really are going to influence our HR so, um, supply in the marketplace, what might be available to us outside of our organization. One of the things that we have to be aware of is that, um, and this is an example on this next slide, um, is about is, it's basically how you manage a Markovian analysis, it's some of the basic statistics to do uh, what we call a Markovian analysis. And what you're looking at is, um, for every position, um, people can either be promoted or they could be demoted or they could um, leave for some reason. And so what we want to look at is what are some potential ways we can get new people into the company or new people into positions. We can hire people from the outside, we can transfer them laterally from other positions, we can promote them from within, or we can take a recall um, in a law, uh, an employee that's been laid off and we can recall them and bring them back into the company. And so that creates um, uh, an opportunity for us to get a flow of people from outside of the company or from different parts of the company into this new area. Outflows can be things like I'm being promoted out of this area and into a new position, or I am um, turning over and I'm leaving the company, so people will be leaving for a variety of reasons. Um, I might be firing people or demoting them, or I might have people that retire because they're, they're done. So in order for us to know what we need for next year, we need to know what our current staffing level is. We need to know who's leaving 
we need to know where we could get potential people coming in. And we've got historical data on this. And that will give us a good sense of what our internal supply will be. If our internal supply meets our needs, then it's great. We don't need to hire from outside. But a lot of times, we don't have enough people inside the company to do our jobs, given the flow of people kind of coming in and out of the company. So we always have to look to supplement our internal sources with external sources by hiring people from outside or you know, doing lateral transfers from other areas. This exercise is something that you guys will be doing in, in your HR simulation, so it's something that you should be uh, very familiar with. Now, moving on from the the planning side, we've got to think about how do we then keep the people so we can minimize turnover and absenteeism and things like that that affect our HR planning. And so one thing that we need to be aware of is the psychological contract. And the psychological contract is this unwritten expectation that um, you're going to pay me to do a job. I'm going to work really hard. I'm going to do certain things. And I'm going to expect you to, to pay me and help me to develop my skills. And in return, I will work really hard. I will make sure that your job gets done to the best of my ability. So we have these expectations um, in an unwritten way between what you, what I want you to do and what, we, what I expect you to do as an employer and an employee relationship. And if that gets violated, that can really affect whether or not someone wants to stay with the company. So we always have to be very mindful of um, not violating that psychological contract. And in fact, we need to really be thinking about how can we ensure that we um, um, are meeting the needs of our employees and talking to them regularly and knowing what their expectations are is really important so that we don't violate um, some of the things that are expected in that unwritten contract. So some of the variables that we want to affect are things like satisfaction, which is, you know, how positive do I feel about my job experiences overall, right? And those are some of the variables that we may want to consider, for example, in our simulation when we're trying to create all these programs and manage morale and things like that. Job satisfaction is always one of those key variables that we're looking for. Um, and as you learn from um, your um, motivation lecture, Job satisfaction really doesn't drive how hard people work. Working really hard and doing a good job drives satisfaction. It's not the reverse. So when you think about this in the terms of, of doing your simulation, making sure people can do their job and do their job well, making sure they have resources, making sure they have the support from the company, making sure they're trained to do their job, if they can perform well, that increases the likelihood they will be satisfied down the line. But satisfaction doesn't drive performance. Performance drives satisfaction. Another variable that we're interested in that affects turnover and absenteeism is commitment. And we have three levels of commitment. We have normative commitment, what I should be doing. Um, you know, I should come to work every day because that's what we're supposed to do. Um, affective commitment, I go to work because I love going to my job. It makes me happy. I want to go. And then continuance commitment. I don't like my job, but I do it because I need a paycheck. So I do it because I have to do it. Um, so we have different levels of commitment. And one of the, the, the areas, of course, that we want to have is affect commitment. We want people to be um, very motivated um, to uh, commit to um, the company. So we want to affect um, the affect of commitment aspect of it. At a minimum, you're going to get continuance commitment, which is people are here because they have to be here. Um, and certainly, if people don't even feel like they have continuance commitment, you're going to start to see the turnover and the absenteeism because suddenly the job is not worth it even just to stay, just to keep the paycheck. Another um, other issues to think about is in terms of individual performance, you know, how do we then get that satisfied worker, how do we make sure that that the high performer becomes satisfied, all those sort of individual components that we were talking about in motivation. Individual performance, which is in slide 13, is, is really key because individual performance is influenced by how, the support that I have, the abilities that I have, and how much effort I'm willing to expend. And that goes right back to that expanded expectancy model. Um, and so you can see how all these things are all tied in together. If people aren't motivated, 
there's going to be less attendance and there's going to be more absenteeism and there's going to be more turnover. Um, so all these factors all kind of work together to make sure that we continue to keep people as motivated as possible. Slide 14 is looking at the relationship between um, individual motivation and ultimately the effect on retention and turnover. So and it basically flows like this. If an individual is highly motivated, they have the abilities, they have all the support, and they encounter a job and they work hard in that job, and they're either going to be satisfied or dissatisfied with their efforts um, to do it. And so if they're satisfied, that does influence organizational commitment. And if they're committed to the organization, that's also going to influence job satisfaction. That's why it's a two-way arrow. And if they have high levels of satisfaction and commitment, they're less likely to leave the company. But if satisfaction is low and commitment is low, they're very highly likely to leave um, and to, to be absent or to leave the company. So it's just a sort of a smaller way of sort of thinking about some of the things that we talk about every day, but you know, so you understand how that works. What are the things that um, drive uh, uh, retention or turnover, really? It's two ways of thinking about it, but it's the two sides of the same coin. The characteristics of the employer will drive retention. If my, cult if my values match the values of the company, I'm more likely to stay. If they don't match, I'm more likely to leave. A good manager, um, if I get along well with my manager and we connect and we have a good working relationship, I'm much more likely to stay than if I have a manager who doesn't treat me with any kind of respect. You know, and I can certainly tell you tons of stories about I've had horrible bosses that I, I would leave in a heartbeat and other bosses that I was I really enjoyed working for and I was incredibly loyal to them because they treated me well and I had a good relationship being able to talk to them. Job security. You know, if I feel secure, I'm going to stay. If I don't feel secure, I'm always going to be looking. I always have sort of one foot out the door, always sort of shopping my resume to see if it can be useful somewhere. Things like job design and work can also influence whether or not someone stays with the company. If it's a good match, if the job's a good match for me and I'm well trained, you know, things will do well. Um, for some people, flexibility in the scheduling is also really important and that keeps them there. Certainly it's what drives me for academia. I have much more flexibility and I can do the things that I want to do, so I'm really driven by that idea of, of flexibility on the job. What's also important to me is, and that goes hand in hand with flexibility, is having work-life balance. So, you know, I know that there's certain things I need to do to do my job, but at the same time I need to sort of balance, you know, with my personal life, and it's important to have that. For example, you know, I'm, uh, you know, having to leave to go and, um, you know, take care of my, my mom, right? So I know that um, it's nice to be able to have some degree of flexibility to be able to do that. Other things that affect retention are things like career opportunities. If there are opportunities for growth for people, they're more likely to stay, and if there aren't, they're more likely to leave. Um, so we want to make sure we have things like career planning and advancement opportunities for folks or they're not going to feel motivated to stay with the company. And then things like reward systems. If there's good reward systems, people are more likely to stay. And if they don't think things are fair or if they don't like the way that they are being recognized for their work, if they're not being recognized at all, they're more likely to leave. Relationships also drive, you know, retention. You know, if I have a good relationship with people, with my supervisor, with my coworkers, I, I want to stay with the company. But if I don't have really good relationships, it's just one more thing that you know pushes me to to leave the company. Ultimately, though, the should I stay or should I go question is really very personal, and it's really about what the um, uh, what the individual perceives in the situation and there are many factors in, you know that are drive retention that the employer really can't control you know if I've got personal things going on in my life the employer can't control that I have to make choices um, you know to support my family so that's not something that my my uh, employer can control and um, so we have to know the difference between what we can control and what we can't control you know, as employers and as managers. What can managers control? They can control tasks. What kind of authority and responsibility they give to people. What kind of tools and resources they have available for them. We can manage uh, stress. 
Uh, we can manage, um, you know, making sure that people aren't stressed. We can make sure they have really good working conditions. The things that we can't control are individual motivation levels, individual interests, um, what their physical characteristics are. If you can't physically do the job, I, I can't help you. I can't physically make change that for you. Um, I can't change it if you're not conscientious or honest or intelligent if you don't have the intelligence to do a particular job. So I think it's really important to know what you can affect as management and what you can't affect as management or HR for that matter. Turnover um, is um, multifaceted and turnover can be functional or dysfunctional, voluntary or involuntary, controllable or uncontrollable. Functional turnover is a good thing. It's a certain percentage of people that we, we want to get rid of our uh, poor performers or our people who don't like following rules, the disciplinary problems. We love them. We want to get rid of them and that's always a good thing. So functional turnover is good. Dysfunctional turnover is when we're in a situation where our best workers are leaving and we don't like that. So we want to make sure we have a situation where we're keeping our good workers and getting rid of the ones who are poor. Voluntary or involuntary is a situation where um, the employee le either the employee leaves on their own by choice, um, and that's voluntary. And sometimes that's because they don't like us for any variety of reasons, and sometimes it's because they just have personal issues that in push them to, to kind of go. Um, you know, for example, a spouse might be moving or a parent is sick and they have to make some choices. Involuntary is where the person is pushed out because of a layoff or they're fired for poor performance or they are a disciplinary problem and they're let go. So in, in, involuntary turnover um, is not always good from the, from the employee's perspective, but it's good because the management, the organization can control involuntary turnover. They, they, will, they manage that because what they're doing is they're weeding out the poor performers or the problem employees. Controllable versus uncontrollable, things that the management can control, as we discussed in the previous slide, versus things that they just can't control. And, you know, and these, these uh, six categories overlap quite a bit. So um, our goal is to try to keep functional turnover, to minimize voluntary, and to make sure most of our turnover is involuntary. And we want things that we can control. So if we can make changes, that's good. We can influence it, and we want to have try to address all the things that we can control um, so that we can take care of our, our employees and make sure we're a stable workforce. There are metrics, of course, for measuring um, turnover, and this is a great example on the next slide. It should be slide 20 about the kind of metrics that we use to assess turnover rates. We look at the cost for separation. We took at their cost for replacing somebody in the company, the training costs to get them up to speed, and there may be a variety of other hidden costs, for example, recruitment costs and things like that. So this gives you a sense of how to calculate your turnover rate. There are metrics, of course, for measuring um, turnover, and this is a great example on the next slide. It should be slide 20 about the kind of metrics that we use to assess turnover rates. We look at the costs for separation. We took at their cost for replacing somebody in the company, the training costs to get them up to speed, and there may be a variety of other hidden costs, for example, recruitment costs and things like that. So this gives you a sense of how to calculate your turnover rate. Um, how do we, other ways to measure turnover? We can measure turnover based on the job. We can measure turnover based on why people leave, um, how long they've been with the company, you know, how, what kind of education and training people have, and there are they, the higher educated, are they more likely to leave or less likely to leave? What kind of KSAs are missing from people, which is why they're leaving? Performance ratings, if they're poor performers, are they leaving? If they're good performers, are they staying, or is it vice versa? So, you know, we can measure turnover in a lot of different ways, um, and when we get into the more advanced classes, we really do try to hone in on the different measures of turnover and think about those metrically. And so um, slide 22 is just a great example of sort of calculating the cost for turnover for a particular position, which was in this case was a bank teller.
So in managing retention, we want to look at uh, measurement and assessment. We want to look at um, our turnover rates and do exit interviews, analyze our data, collect our data, measure it, analyze it, and see what's going on. Then we design interventions. And is the reason why people are leaving because we're hiring the wrong people, we're not hiring people with the right skills, or is it because we're not doing a good job getting them oriented into the company and knowing how to do the job? Um, are we not paying them well? Are we not training them well? Are we not creating job opportunities for them? Or are things just really lousy in terms of company policies and, and, and communication and things like that with respect to employee relations? And lastly, what we want to do when we're managing the turnover thing is, is assessing, you know, tracking the turnover and assessing whether or not the interventions that we've created in order to improve selection, improve training, improve compensation, whether or not these things are actually working. Um, how do we kind of assess that then? Well, we look at employee surveys, we might do exit interviews with some of our employees, and we might look at how many people leave within the first year. And that could tell us an awful lot about how satisfied people are with the job. So slide 25, there's a, there's a bunch of really great interventions in terms of how do we get people to keep them here, stay here, different things that you can do, sampling of them, career counseling, mentoring, diverse workforces, making sure that you, ha you provide telecommuting, fair pay, fulfilling work. All these things feel like no-brainers, but the bottom line is companies forget that they really do have to treat employees well because as we've said the first day of class, right? People are the only resource that gets up in the morning and they have a mind of their own and will decide whether or not they want to actually come into work. And if they don't want to come into work, either they're the wrong person for the job or you're doing a lousy job of getting them excited about doing the work. And that's where the hard part comes into our jobs. The last variable that we want to focus on is absenteeism, and, and there's a number of reasons why people are absent. The most predominant reason, of course, is because people get ill, and it might be because they're ill from um, getting hurt on the job, which is always possible, but, you know, um, absenteeism typically comes from illness, it comes from family-related issues, which is the biggest chunk of stuff. Sometimes people leave just because they need a personal day, so personal need it might be there. Stress on the job, and, and, and or people will just take absentees, absent days because they feel entitled to it. Well, I earned it, so I'm going to take it no matter what. And they may not have any particular reason why they're, they're not coming into work. They just simply decide that they're entitled to the time off, and they'll take it. Absenteeism can be a real problem for a lot of companies, and so there's a lot of different ways that we can manage it. One is, you know, having obviously a disciplinary procedure where people get punished for um, abusing um, absenteeism time. Um, you might want to obviously verify whether or not someone is actually sick. Did they go to the doctor? You know, what kind of medicine are they using? Is there some way to verify that they were actually sick? Another thing you can think about is um, if people don't use their absenteeism days, you actually give them cash for it at the end of the year, and then they wipe their slate clean, and then they earn, you know, absenteeism day. They earn the rights for days off, you know, starting with the beginning of the next year. If they use it, great. If they don't, then they get the money back for it, and that, that works out really nicely for people. Some people can just do paid time off in a broad sense, um, where you, instead of having, well, this is a sick day versus a personal day, you can actually um, just have a giant pool where people can just take whatever time they need whenever they need it. Uh, the next one is no-fault policies, where you can have um, uh, a policy where you can say people can have whatever time off they have, but if they go over a certain amount of time and they're abusing the privilege and they're not self-managing appropriately, then they might get disciplined. But otherwise, the no-fault policies are nice because it means that they can kind of take whatever... Um, you know, whatever time they need, um, you know, however they want to use it. And this gets back to that issue of 
family family structures and family styles and how some families, you know, single moms or single dads, you know, having to deal with, um, you know, different needs than uh, a single person who has no kids. So how do we make sure that the benefits are equitable so that everybody gets an opportunity to get, um, you know, uh, time off as they need to. And those no-fault policies or paid time off programs work really well to create that sense of fairness. Lastly is the uh, attendance rewards, where basically you give people money um, as a prize, or you honor them with, a, you know, um, uh, gifts or um, plaques or uh, certificates of some sort to congratulate them for not taking time off. And those kind of things are fun. Um, obviously, we measure metrics for absenteeism too. Um, we measure them by incident rates, inactivity rates, or severity rates, and there's a whole lot of different numbers that we can use <clears throat> to assess, um, you know, a metric for absenteeism. So you should be aware of how those things are calculated. Um, other things that we can look at is. Um, the impact of uh, absenteeism on lost wages, on benefits, on how much overtime do we use when people are absent, what's the supervisor's time, how much are they engaged in doing work, you know, all sorts of things like that. So, you know, as promised, you know, as we talk about different areas and issues, these metrics start to come up and we think about different ways that we can measure the outcomes and make sure that we're assessing these things appropriately. That's it for this lecture. Thank you very much.